This is the story of Pan Am Flight 799. Pan Am, in a way, it was the Emirates of its day. It had a wide route network, amazing onboard product, and a kind of je ne sais quoi that very few airlines have. Over its long storied history, it operated a lot of groundbreaking planes, including the 707. On the 26th of December 1968, a cargo 707 was on its way from LA to Cam Ranh in Vietnam with two stopovers in Anchorage and Da Nang, Vietnam. The flight wasn't off to a good start. The leg from LA to Anchorage was fine, but they couldn't land at Anchorage due to bad weather, so the captain opted to land at nearby Elmendorf Airport. This made things a bit difficult for Pan Am. The pilots who would fly the next leg were at the airport in Anchorage, and now they'd have to commute to Elmendorf. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal, but it's a nuisance nonetheless. When they finally got to Elmendorf, both pilots got to talk a bit and they chatted about the plane. Apparently, the thrust reverser on engine number 4 was being a bit troublesome. On top of that, timing at Alaska was another tricky thing. A lot of planes overflew Alaska, so you had to take off at a very specific time and take your place in the imaginary highway in the sky so that the planes were spaced out by a very safe margin. But it would be hard for flight 799 to stick to those timings on the 26th of December as they were having some trouble on the ground. They had some fuel calculation issues and they needed to add more fuel to the plane. They then couldn't get the engines to start as the ground equipment was having some issues. By 6.02 a.m. the plane was alive and it was headed for the runway. But the plane was held up again. The pilots wanted to climb to 31,000 feet and then climb to 35,000 feet after burning some fuel. But since they were delayed, they missed their takeoff window. If they were to take off right now, they'd have some traffic conflicts with those long-range planes. There was another way they could take off right now. They'd just have to cruise at a lower altitude, but that would burn too much fuel, and so the pilots opted to wait for 45 minutes, and the plane stood there in the freezing cold. Finally, it was time for them to go. They would be taking off from runway 23 as it was longer. As the crew did their checklist, they called for a follow me vehicle. It's basically a truck or car that you follow if you're not familiar with the airport. They taxied. The captain was focused on taxiing the plane safely on the icy taxiway. The first officer was on the radio with Oceanic Control, making sure that they were safe to climb. And the flight engineer was busy crunching numbers to see how quickly they'd be able to get up to 35,000 feet. Even as the plane lined up, the first officer was on the radio with Oceanic Control, making sure that their takeoff time was correct. Once everything was done, the captain looked over to the first officer and said, Okay, you got it. The four engines of the 707 roared to life, pushing the plane down the runway. The plane lifted off into the sky, but instantly something was wrong. Their control columns began vibrating. This was a warning. They were very close to a stall. People watching from the airport saw the plane take off, but they could tell that it was struggling to gain altitude. Soon the plane stopped climbing altogether. Its right wing began to drop, and within seconds, the nose did as well. 2,700 feet from the foot of the runway, the right wing tip contacted the frozen ground, and the plane crashed. None of the three people on board survived. The plane was destroyed, and the investigators began sifting through the wreckage. They found the elevators. They measured the screws that drove the elevators up and down. It was set at 3.5 degrees of nose up, the correct setting for the amount of mass that they had on board. The landing gears were also found. They had not been retracted. It makes sense, the pilots did not have the time or the opportunity to retract the gear. Then they got to the wings and the ailerons. Ailerons are little surfaces that move to control the roll of the plane. The outboard ailerons were all locked up. That was strange, they weren't supposed to be locked up on takeoff. In fact, if the flaps were to be retracted, then the systems would automatically lock out the outboard ailerons. This led the investigators to question, did the pilots extend the flaps before takeoff? The answer was simple enough. The flaps were driven by jack screws, and by measuring the amount by which they were extended, you could figure out if the flaps were deployed or not. The evidence was clear. Pan Am Flight 799 took off without its flaps. This is very, very unusual. Taking off without the flaps is unheard of because flaps give you a lot of lift at low speeds. When you're taking off, you need all the lift that you can get. But it's hard to understand why something like this would happen. 
This is such a basic part of flight, and it's almost unthinkable that an experienced crew would forget to extend their flaps. There are checklists designed specifically to prevent this. The taxi checklist, to be precise. Listening to the CVR, they uncovered something interesting. When they went through the taxi checklist, the first officer did extend the flaps to 14 degrees. But unknown to him, the captain retracted the flaps because that's what the cold weather operations manual called for. They did not want the flaps to get iced up after all. When they went through the taxi checklist for a second time, the first officer was made aware of the retracted flaps, and that's when he said this, quote, Oh, okay, let's not forget them, end quote. Tragically, flaps do not appear anywhere else in the checklist after the taxi checklist. After this, the pilots were incredibly busy. The captain was taxiing on icy taxiways at an unfamiliar airport. The first officer was on the radio trying to sort out their departure times so that there wouldn't be any traffic conflicts. The report calls the mood in the cockpit tense. They were under a lot of mental stress. They just wanted to take off, and they wanted it fast. But sticking with the CVR, it gave them another clue. When you take off without flaps, you get a warning called a takeoff configuration warning. When pilots hear that, they know that their plane is not configured for takeoff. In this case, the flaps were not out, and as soon as the engine spooled up to takeoff power, it should have triggered the warning. But there was nothing to be heard on the CVR. They talked to the pilots who flew the plane to Elmendorf. They verified that the takeoff configuration warning system was working when they flew the plane. Investigators took another 747 and triggered the warning on that plane to make sure that you could actually hear the warning on the CVR. Had the warning gone off, they would have heard it on the CVR. So why didn't the plane warn the pilots about their retracted flaps? The takeoff configuration warning system works based off of the position of the throttles. When the throttles move through 42 degrees of motion, the warning system is armed and the plane starts checking the takeoff configuration to see if everything's alright. Digging through the archives, they found service bulletin number 2384. It pertained to the takeoff configuration warning system in cold weather. As I mentioned before, the takeoff warning system is activated when the throttles move through 42 degrees of motion. Under normal circumstances, you have to push the throttles forward quite a bit to achieve takeoff power. This meant pushing the throttles through the 42 degrees of motion threshold and the takeoff warning system would be activated. But jet engines are interesting. They don't perform that well when it's really hot outside. When temperature goes up, performance goes down. The opposite is also true. When temperature goes down, performance goes up. That meant that if it was really cold outside, then you could get takeoff power from the engines without pushing the throttles all the way forward. For example, Let's say that in cold weather, you could get the engines to take off power by moving the throttles through just 35 degrees of motion. This meant that in cold weather, the throttles would not be moved forward enough to activate the takeoff configuration warning system because you could get the takeoff power sooner than later. This is what service bulletin number 2384 was all about. It asked them to change the 42 degree threshold to 25 degrees in cold weather operations. So even if you move the throttles through a relatively small amount, the takeoff configuration warning system would be armed. But Boeing did not define cold weather operations. How cold was too cold? When the investigators asked Boeing, they said that the normal warning threshold would work if the temperature was above 33 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius. If you lowered the threshold to 25 degrees, then the warning would work down to negative 43 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 41 degrees Celsius. On the accident day, it was 6 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 14 degrees Celsius. The takeoff system had not been calibrated properly, so the pilots took off without the warning that could have saved them. One of the recommendations for this crash had to do with checklists and how they were designed. In this case, the flaps were only mentioned in the taxi checklist, and they were not mentioned after that. Had they been mentioned one more time, the pilots may have caught their mistake. The board recommended a checklist redesign that would remind pilots of critical information right before takeoff. But unfortunately, these warnings went unheeded. On the 16th of August, 1987, Northwest Flight 255 was taking off from Detroit and it crashed right after takeoff, killing 156 people. The cause? Taking off without flaps and slats. 
This finally spurred the industry to take action and to redesign checklists. It took another major disaster to bring about change. So what do you think? What was the biggest contributor to this crash? The pilots forgetting to extend the flaps, the disarmed warning system, or the defective checklist? If you want to watch a similar video, you'll find the story of JL Cargo 8054 interesting. You can find a link to that video on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.